Over to you, Lide. Good morning, Jan Ravinaka. Uh, hello, I'll get um, Bulevinaka to everyone that's uh, joining us today on this second of the democratic series of Melanesia, uh, the democratic conversations around Melanesia webinar series. Uh, we started this conversation two weeks ago now, I think, and now we're, uh, we, we started with Papua New Guinea and now we're moving on um, to the Solomon Islands. It is, um, I feel very inadequate because I'm in such great company uh, this morning uh, in terms of um, the wonderful speakers that International Idea has been able to uh, bring together given their their work in the, uh, in the Pacific region. And so it's my absolute pleasure to introduce them. But just before I do that, I would like to introduce a little bit of um, why we're having these conversations around uh, democratic processes and particularly um, uh, the anti-corruption work and the anti-corruption um, structures uh, that exists in the Pacific. So um, held as part of International Ideas um, Democratic Development Work in Melanesia, this online panel discussion um, has focused on Melanesian countries. Today, we're focusing on the Solomon Islands. And the rationale behind that is that with a score of 43, 43 in the Transparency International's uh, 2021 uh, Corruption Perception Index or CPI, the Solomon Islands remain stagnant in terms of how they're rated in the work they do to address corruption. And this is a characteristic that spreads across Melanesia, hence the important work uh, of international idea. So what we're doing today, like we've done um, over this past couple of weeks and like we will continue to do um, with international idea is to look at the drivers of corruption, look at what is it that exists in, in our region and in particular our specific countries that drives corruption or maybe um, that changes the way we have to address corruption in our societies. So we're looking at um, specific anti-corruption measures that have taken place since 2018. Uh, on the panel today um, is Miss Ruth Lilakula. Uh, one talk, my apologies if I've not properly um, introduced your name, uh, but I, I will say that I will do Miss Lilakula a very little justice in the way that I describe her stellar career. Uh, an agriculturalist by profession with undergraduate and master's qualifications from across Malaysia as well as in uh, Britain, uh, the United Kingdom, Ms. Lilakula was a career civil servant, um, having taken up uh, a lot of the leadership positions, senior leadership positions within her, her field of agricultural science, but also moving into uh, police, national planning, national security. Um, and her, her civil service career culminated with uh, the, the being uh, appointed uh, the first woman to hold the position of secretary to cabinet. Uh, now, Ms. Lulukula is the chief executive of Transparency Solomon Islands, an NGO that's focused on promoting anti-corruption measures in the country. And um, even in that field, um, she's led a stellar career too, having been the recipient of the 2019 Transparency International Amalia Award award um, in the professional excellence category. Our um, uh, second panelist is uh, a consistent panelist from uh, our previous um, panel discussion on Papua New Guinea. Uh, Dr. Grant Walton is a fellow uh, at the Development Policy uh, Center of the Crawford School of um, Public Policy, um, in, in which he is also the convener of the Integrity and Anti-Corruption Specialization of the Crawford School of um, uh, Public Policy, which is, of course, a research-intensive policy school within the ANU's College of Asia and the Pacific at the National, um, the Australian National University. Um, so a lot of his work, a lot of his research has been in and around uh, the socioeconomic um, challenges, let's put, let's call it that, of um, uh, uh, the wider Pacific region, but with a very specific focus on Melanesia. So um, we're going to have quite a dynamic conversation here. Um, the one and a half hours that we've set aside probably is not going to be enough uh, for everything that we'd like to discuss about what the emerging issues are in and around uh, corruption and anti-corruption work, anti-corruption work, but uh, we will try to spark more conversations, which is the main goal of these webinar series. So it's my absolute pleasure to welcome uh, my one talk, um, Ms. Lulukula, to the mic to begin with 
um, her contribution, her presentation to this conversation, uh, after which we will allow maybe one burning question if there is one, but we'd like to encourage everyone um, to use the Q&A feature of this Zoom platform um, to take record of all of your questions as they come to mind, uh, because what we would like is that after Ms. Lilakula's presentation, we will go directly to Dr. Walton, um, after which we'd like to have a more free flowing interactive um, conversation. Uh, but just before we open up um, the mic and then open up the floor, I would just like to remind, uh, I, would, I would like to welcome, first of all, all of our participants. I understand that there were 80 who were registered to be part of this conversation. And so we're very heartened by the interest um, and the contribution to the body of work being done. Uh, at this point, I would like to uh, just remind everyone by way of a disclaimer that uh, you know, the opinions being expressed here today don't necessarily represent that of international idea. And so we um, reserve um, uh, the relevant and associated rights. Uh, without further ado, I would like to now welcome to the mic, um, Ms. Lulukula Tanaka. Uh, uh, Moboni and uh, yeah, well, I think you do mean, but I will start and uh, um, I'm going to. I'm not familiar with the screen thing. So yeah, the screen, uh, let's see if I can do it. Um, then uh, do the presentation. Can you see my screen? Yeah. This one. Say, uh, uh, this for uh, presentation. Okay, we'll try again. No, the yes. slide so. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes. Hello. We can. Thank you. Okay. All right. The uh, we'll do the this. Um, Democratic development, thank you for inviting me to be a panelist, this one focusing on Solomon Islands. So the Corruption Perception Index, CPA, by the Solomon Islands case. The Corruption Perception Index is one of transparency, international legacy, and it's initiated in 1995 of the uh, global movement. It measures is the tool relies on external data sources, reflecting the opinions and perceptions of surveys, respondents from the private uh, business communities. CPI, as you know, is a reflection of the opinions and perceptions of our corrupt or corruption in the public sector, sector from the private sector. The data in CPI is not collected nor produced by Transparency International Secretary and its national chapters. CPI measures perceived levels of public sector corruption and not at the actual levels of all forms of corruption inside the public sector and of perceptions of corruption and not the actual corruption. So, a CPI score and rank CPI 100 of a corrupt or clean position where a country is placed in the corrupt and 100 is very clean. A CPI score below 50 indicates serious levels of public sector, sector corruption. Since 2012, CPI scores are comparable from year to year. CPI rankings are not comparable from year to year. Rankings are only useful to see where a country is placed 
compared to other countries in the same year. Common to see small changes or minus score fluctuations. Um, these may not be statistically significant. Important that CPI messaging consider or reflect experiences and observations on the ground of those who of us who are on the ground and do, do a balanced reporting messaging. Things that we are focusing attention on where the achievements and innovative programs that are being pursued in the fight against corruption by ordinary citizens, government and CSO. So it's uh, putting a positive spin and an encouraging one uh, uh, is uh, uh, the way to go. Now, CPI score for Solomon Islands since 2016. Um, 2021, our score was 43 and we were ranked 77. 2020, we were 42, ranked 78. 2019, we were still at 42, ranked 77. 2018, 44, uh, ranked 70. 2017, uh, 39, ranked 85. And in 2016, it was 42, and uh, no ranking was given. Solomon Islands was a country in the Asia Pacific region in 2018 that improved its score the most from 2017 to 2018 by plus five points. Its score in 2017 was 39. In 2019, Solomon Islands score dropped back by two points to 42 in 42 and in 2021, CBI score was 43. Since 2026, when it appeared back in the CPI score and ranking, Solomon Islands maintains its CPI score at 42. There are things that we have done together as a country that has helped enact the establishment of the Solomon Islands Independent Commission Against Corruption. The, our media covering more and more about uh, corruption-related uh, um, news and others being able to hear their views on air and in radio. And also there's a willingness for those in the authorities to hear and invite civil society organization participations in policies and legislative uh, reforms and freedom of press and media is, is here. But this are changing. Just before the 2019 national general election, there was a burst of uh, investigations, detentions by the police of abuses and misuse of power. Citizens, after the election, launched 29 petitions against winning candidates. These have contributed to this awful trade, but since then, the government's effort to combat corruption in the public sector has stagnated, as shared earlier. Solomon Islands is in the bottom half of the table despite the upward movements in its CPI score. There was just a modest increase of plus two points and 44 out of 100 means a highly corrupt and politicized public sector. People's voices, space, activism, uh, stubbly or silently being, and but surely being restricted. And democracy in a country, as you know, because it's kind of the world will become the world news for the wrong things. Um, uh, what's happening in the country? This means Solomon Islands has highly corrupt public sector. Confirmed. This is further confirmed by the Global Corruption Barometer Pacific 2021. The Global Corruption Barometer Pacific 2021. While the CPI is measurement of the perceptions of public sector corruption from experts and business people, the global corruption barometer is a measurement of perceptions, observation, and actual experiences of public sector corruption from ordinary citizens of Solomon Islands. The Corruption Perception D Index of Solomon Islands shows that government's efforts to tackle corruption in the public sector is not going anywhere or has become stagnant. Private and public sector vote. 
the Global Corruption Barometer Pacific 2021 of Transparency International confirms this opinions, experience, perception, observations of the people. The key government institution that should be leading or providing the leadership, bringing in reforms in this fight are the most corrupt per GCB Pacific 2021. According to the experiences, opinions, observations, and perception of the citizens and people of Sol in Solomon Islands, the most corrupt institutions are members of parliaments, 55 uh, companies extracting natural resources. Our government is actually in the hands of the loggers. The prime minister and officials in his office, business executive, civil servants, and the police. So you can see who do you report uh, corruption to when the system is so corrupt already. According to the key findings for Solomon Islands of the Global Corruption Barometer Pacific 20. 21, 97% of the respondents see corruption in the government as a big problem. 90% of the respondents see corruption in the business sector as a big problem, and it is their uh, views that are captured in um, CPI. So uh, I don't know how to what to make of that. 52% of the respondents say government is not doing a good job fighting corruption. Public official engaged in corruption rarely or never face consequences. The most important component of a democratic state country are its people, collective decision making and rule of law. The CPI scores for Solomon Islands reflects the efforts of the executive government tackling corruption levels in the public sector. It's not doing very much. These efforts have stagnated since 2016. The Global Corruption Barometer Pacific 2021 reveals some of the reasons for the stagnation in the government's uh, uh, corruption fight strangle. The very institution that should lead this fight and protect democracy are the most corrupt. Accountability in political decision makers is at its lowest. There is very little integrity in the relationship between the government and the private sector. Government is run by a few big interests, loggers and miners, and driven by the deliverables demanded by some foreign interests. Whilst international and regional elections say election, election, election observers say elections are free and fair, they are not in Solomon Islands and don't just don't know how corrupt and how rigged these elections are. Reliance on money or connections to obtain government contracts still is a huge issue. Public officers engaged in corruption conduct and practice rarely or never face consequences. Since COVID-19 crisis, authoritarian approach to managing crisis has taken on a stronghold, restricting civil society space, ways, and activism. Democracy and human rights are under attack with a very powerful support of external powerful partners of the executive government. Civil society waste, space activism, holding power to account have been further restricted and denied under COVID-19 state of emergency uh, regulations and the invading of authoritarian practices displayed by the current government. Recommendation is a transparent Solomon Island on democratic countries. Um, as calls on democratic countries to support the efforts of CSO, such as that of Transparency Solomon Islands to protect democracy, human rights, and through the empowerment of citizens, especially youth, with key and critical knowledge about the democratic, political, legal, civil, and human rights to all government to account. 70% of the population of Solomon Islands are aged between 18 years to 34 years. They can bring about change when empowered with key and critical knowledge and information to engage in debate uh, constructively. More importantly, to combat the monetization of national general election, allowing people to choose their representatives without undue influence of money. People have the power to bring about good change, but first they must know where they fit into the big picture. Call to action on government to strengthen um, the engagement with citizens and communities to drive 
the reform required for tackling uh, corruption. Complacency in fighting corruption exacerbates human rights, abuses, undermines democracy and development. The erosion of freedoms, human rights, and democracy can only pave the way for authoritarianism contributing to even higher levels of corruption. Way forward is empower citizens, especially the youth with key and critical knowledge about the democratic, constitutional, political, legal, civil, and human rights to constructively charge, challenge injustice, call out corruption, and demand their rights. And they need funding for that. Thank you for uh, listening. That completes me. Thank you so much. I, uh, I don't see any questions coming yet from the audience, which is great. I'm going to move us uh, on to Dr. Watson now. Um, Grant, you can, uh, Ruth, I have asked you to mute your mic and turn off your video just to improve your connectivity on your end. Um, it seems that the internet is, uh, connectivity is an issue everywhere in the last couple of weeks. Uh, Grant, you have the mic now uh, for your take on the summer. Hi everybody, and um, thank you for the um, for that wonderful presentation, uh, Ruth. It's a hard uh, act to, to follow. Uh, thank you to the organisers for putting on this this um, this discussion today. And uh, before I begin, I would also like to acknowledge and celebrate the Ngunnawal people on whose land that I am presenting to you from, and celebrate their elders, past and present. So today I'm going to talk to you um, about um, some of the measures and solutions to corruption in Solomon Islands. And, um, and I'm just kind of leading on from, uh, I suppose, uh, following on from Ruth's presentation. What I want to do is to draw on a variety of measures to show what we know about the nature of corruption in Solomon Islands. And Ruth's already talked about, uh, about some of these. I'm going to talk about some others. And then I'm going to highlight some of the key challenges to addressing it. And, um, and a part of that, we'll be having a look at some of the measures that we might not necessarily think of when we, when we think about responding to corruption. All right, so let's have a look um, at, uh, first of all, measures of corruption in the Solomon Islands. Now, Ruth's gone through the red line, which is, of course, the... Um, the Corruption Perceptions Index score for Solomon Islands. I want to, though, take you through the blue line. Now, the blue line is the worldwide governance indicators control of corruption um, indicator. Now, what that tells you is how well um, governments are perceived to be doing in relation to controlling corruption. You can see that the Solomon Islands has, uh, it was pretty flat between 2007 to 2000 and about 16, and then it's improved. And whilst there's a recent dip um, between 20 and 2020 and 2021, um, overall, uh, there has been some sense of improvement. Now, this, these are international measures, right? This is mostly about uh, international perceptions of how well Solomon Islands is doing. Um, now, again, if we have a look at, um, at how well Solomon Islands is doing in terms of this control of corruption measure, and I'm using this because it includes more Pacific Island countries than the Corruption Perceptions Index, you can see that Solomon Islands is perceived to be doing better than Papua New Guinea, Nauru, Palau and Tonga um, at the moment, but not as well as a number of other countries, including Fiji, Kiribati, Samoa, uh, Tuvalu. Now, I want to highlight something here. The countries that are seen to be doing very well on these in, in, in indicators, New, uh, New Zealand and Australia. But I'm going to come back to this and I'm going to suggest that actually Australia and New Zealand, while playing a role to respond to corruption in Solomon Islands, also play an important role in helping to perpetuate corruption in the country. Now, Ruth has gone through some of these uh, uh, um, uh, some of these findings from the, the um, global corruption barometer. I'm not going to go through all of them. I want to highlight I want to highlight really one um, 
uh, one, one thing here, and that is that 2% of those who paid a bribe um, uh, reported it to, uh, to authorities. People are really concerned. People are, 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 are not, even though they, they may be um, uh, asked for a, for a bribe or some sort of um, engagement in corruption, are not responding to it. And as Ruth said, corruption is most associated with MPs, extractive companies, particularly logging companies, and the Prime Minister in that survey. And we've seen the concerns about corruption in uh, Solomon Islands have erupted into civil unrest in the past. The most recent um, example of this in, the, in November 2021, uh, where some have said that, uh, that this uh, protest was about the um, switch of allegiance, uh, alliance um, from Solomon Islands recognising Taiwan to moving to a one China policy. Um, but as a number of commentators have suggested, corruption played a really important role in this protest. In other words, Solomon Islanders are really concerned about corruption in the country, and sometimes this spills over into unrest. The largest um, sector of concern, uh, and there are a number of sectors to be concerned about, Ruth's gone through a number of those, um, but many are concerned about the logging sector, which is seen, estimated to be the largest in, uh, export industry of around about 70% of export income. Uh, and it features a collusion between state officials and the timber industry, and that's resulted in, according to the UNODC, the blurring of legal and illegal trade in relation to formal export-oriented log production, with senior ministers having direct interest in logging concessions. So there are concerns about what is happening in the Solomon Islands in the logging sector um, and, and the corruption that, has, um, that continues on in that sector. But it's really important to know that the logging sector is not just contained within the borders of Solomon Islands. It's transnational in its makeup. Transnational companies come into Solomon Islands and they, and they take logs away and they export them, most of which um, end up in China for processing into things like tables and chairs and other consumer goods. And Waru has talked about um, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the role that uh, international companies play in this. Uh, he stated that uh, the government has been unable to maximise its revenue capture from the logging industry. Uh, to avoid paying taxes and fees, logging companies exploit transfer prices, tax exemptions, the under or misreporting of log prices, log species and volumes, and the fragmentation of responsibilities between different agencies within um, Solomon Islands. And this is a, um, a graphic of, the, uh, of how logs move out of Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands and in other countries, and they end up in China for processing and come back to countries like Australia. Um, and these are some of the estimates that were done about a decade ago of uh, the, the, the value of these, uh, of, of the illegal logs that are coming out of the sector. These figures are a bit rubbery, but uh, suffice it to say, it's a significant proportion of um, the logging sector. In terms of another transnational um, uh, area, Solomon and, and looking at money laundering, a, a recent report by Nguyen and Hopkins for Transparency International has shown, uh, has argued that Solomon Islands itself faces a low risk of transnational money laundering. But it's the foreign destinations where corruption occurs within the so Solomon Islands and, and then, is, um, then is sent overseas that is of most concern. And they highlight the foreign destinations for the laundered proceeds of corruption, including China, Australia, Malaysia, and Singapore. So when we have a look at where corrupt money ends up, oftentimes it's not the developing countries, it's not in the Pacific, it's actually in other developed Western countries. The United States, in fact, even though on the Corruption Perceptions Index and other indicators is considered the least one of the you know one of the better performing uh, uh, countries around the world around about top 20 or so um, in terms of um, it's um, it's being a destination for corrupt proceeds it's it's the worst in the world um, Singapore uh, another country that was identified in that report ranks at number three China at number 11 Australia does better 
But in terms of all of the Pacific countries that are included in the, trans, the Tax Justice Network's Financial Secrecy Index, it ranks worse than all the other Pacific Island countries included in it. So Nauru, uh, which is down the bottom here, um, actually had a, um, uh, had a, a blacklisting for its role in anti-money laundering, um, which basically destabilized its um, formal financial system. Uh, and, and so what this shows us is that in any response to corruption, we need to be including uh, not only you know, Solomon Islands government, but others, other countries around the world that play a role in helping to facilitate corruption, even if in indirect ways. So here's, I want to move on now to some of the challenges uh, and opportunities, I should say, to addressing corruption in Solomon Islands. So there are some causes for, for optimism, I think. Um, Ramsey rebuilt a number of uh, the Ramsey intervention that started in 2003 and ended up in 2017 in Solomon Islands, rebuilt a number of key anti-corruption organisations and introduced processes, particularly in the government, um, and, and for improving the management of, of funding. However, there have been criticisms um, of Ramsey's efforts, particularly its uh, lack of effort for cleaning up the logging industry and also for its um, inability to respond to the political dimensions of corruption, the political networks that facilitate corruption. In 2017, the, the uh, government introduced a national anti-corruption strategy that's resulted in a number of different acts. The Ombudsman Act, which increased the powers of the, of the Ombudsman, the Whistleblower Protection Act, which was introduced in 2018, and the Crown and Glory, the Anti-Corruption Bill, which established the Solomon Islands ICAC in 2018. Now, the government has budgeted some funding for this in 2021 and 2022, but it has um, been budgeted to receive around about half of what the, the uh, actually less than half of what the current, uh, what's been allocated for the Ombudsman. So there's still some way to go in establishing this organization. And of course, um, Ruth talked about so, so passionately and, and eloquently about civil society efforts. And uh, we've certainly seen those efforts helping to lobby government being, being um, quite robust. Although, as Ruth said, there has been some pushback from government, um, you know, particularly around, uh, particularly during COVID-19. I want to now have a look at the, the, the funding for anti-corruption organisations. This is some work I've been doing with my colleague, uh, Husni Hushang. We've been uh, looking at how much the government has been allocating and spending on key anti-corruption organisations. Now, we're doing this as a proportion of the budget. So what this shows us is how... Um, much of a priority the government is paying to key anti-corruption organizations here we've got the auditor general leadership co-commission the icac and the ombudsman commission and what you see is that in terms of the blue line which is how much is budgeted or promised um it's been relatively consistent it dipped down initially and, but it's gone back up and that is because there has been more funding that has been promised to the the solomon islands icac over the last couple of years um, but the of real concern is this growing gap between how much has been promised in the budget and how much key anti-corruption organisations receive. And this, I think, is, um, is, is of concern and needs to be addressed. Um, logging, there are a number of people that are experts in this area, um, more expert than, than I am, but they have highlighted a number of improvements that could take um, place in the, um, around the, the logging sector, national improvements such as improving legal frameworks and, and, um, and uh, laws around customary ownership and, and the, the, um, uh, the interface between um, traditional uh, customary laws and and um, and government laws around this um, monitoring and policing is a, you know a key issue as well as community engage engagement and awareness ar ar around uh, um, logging and, and uh, community rights and so on. But there are also transnational dimensions that are really um, and responses that are really important as a part of this. And Hannah Harris has been writing on this recently, um, talking about the responsibility that destination countries, countries like Australia, play in um, uh, in in um, framing legal responses 
uh, to help to uh, to monitor uh, the the legality of logs that are coming into the country. And she's talked about the role that technology can play, for example, in detecting the origin and species of timber products. Um, and, and there's also, of course, the, the role of uh, addressing issues like transfer pricing, which helps companies to uh, avoid paying tax and transferring um, profits to, uh, to the Solomon's government, um, tax credits and, and, and other things. I want to also talk about this, um, this issue of culture, because it often comes up when we talk about corruption, you know, across Melanesia. And for many, and this is this has been highlighted in surveys, um, the Wontok system is uh, can be seen as a key cause of corruption. Citizens often see that it's a key driver of, of corruption. This has been brought up in, in surveys across the country. However, some of the research that I've been doing, I've been doing research with those involved in anti-corruption reforms in Solomon Islands um, over the past few years. And these the interviews that I've had with people has really reinforced that the that the Wontok system actually can be a potential response to corruption. For example, um, a number of uh, uh, public servant, uh, sorry, a number of res respondents um, uh, to my research have talked about how they draw on the Wontok system to respond to corruption. One senior anti-corruption policymaker, for example, said, uh, "We draw on Wontok relations every day." As a relative or a friend, you call him up and check what's going on. That's the same as networking, actually. When it comes to investigations, it's easier to work with a relative. I know this guy, and if you ask him whether it's confidential or not, then they can release it, and it's easier that way. So this suggests that people are already using the Wontok system to help fight corruption. I think perhaps there's more research that could be done to highlight ways that the Wontok system can be drawn upon because this informal system of reciprocity is, um, uh, is, is particularly important given that there are limited resources to respond to corruption. Just one particular area of, um, of, um, uh, of potential response. And um, other responses we've found around the world that uh, when citizens are um, uh, um, educated, they're more likely to support anti-corruption efforts. And my research, along with my colleague Karen Pfeiffer, has found that it has been the case in um, Papua New Guinea. We found that uh, when people are uh, educated past primary school level, they're more likely to report it as long as they trust that something will be done about corruption. In Solomon Islands, we see relatively low um, uh, primary enrollment and, and particularly roles second net secondary enrollment. So this is not often talked about in terms of anti-corruption responses, but improving um, the enrollments and quality of education is a um, is, is is a potentially powerful anti-corruption response. Messages around corruption can also play a role. Uh, we found that in, in the context of Papua New Guinea, more people are likely to report corruption if messages stress the impact on local communities. And this reflects back on the importance of the, the one-talk system and, of commun and, and communal life in the country. Um, this kind of research could be repeated in, in Solomon Islands, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those areas that could help um, to, to get citizens on, on board and responding to it or building on, on efforts that have already been established, as Ruth has, has said. Um, Gender is another area. 33% uh, of um, the responses to the global corruption barometer in Solomon Islands had said that they'd experienced extortion or knew of someone who had clearly um, corruption impacts on women different than men, and we need more research to highlight um, how this is the case. The Global Corruption Barometer actually um, has some of these answers, and I think exploring that data a, a bit, bit more will help to, to reveal um, the differences between men and women. Uh, in terms of anti-money laundering efforts in the Solomon Islands, um, as I said, that it's it's a it's um, in terms of a market, it's, it's a relatively small um, market. But having said that. The country has limited expertise, staffing capacity and resources available for anti-money laundering work, while the banks have been supervised by the Solomon Islands Financial Intelligence Unit um, in relation to anti-money laundering and counter-finance terrorist matters. The small uh, designated uh, non-financial business and prof uh, profession sector has not been under active um, AML supervision. This is 
from Nguyen and Hopkins report. So highlights that there's some more work that could be done uh, in supporting anti-money laundering efforts in the Solomon Islands. Um, but the most important thing here is that we need to have a greater transnational commitment to fighting corruption um, and the corrupt monies that end up elsewhere in places like Singapore and China, but also in places like uh, Australia. I've got a list of um, things that Australia could be doing to, um, to respond to these concerns, including implementing recommendations from a recent Senate standing committee. Uh, there could be more uh, mutual learning between the Solomon Islands ICAC and the, um, and the new National Anti-Corruption Commission that's going to be uh, hopefully introduced in Australia in the coming months. Um, and uh, there's been an ongoing debate um, that's uh, involved a number of, of eminent um, uh, money laundering experts talking about the importance of bolstering cooperation between Australian agencies and Solomon Islands and Pacific partners. Bridie Rice in particular has been writing about this um, and calling for a, a, a Pacific Centre for Financial Crime to be established. It's also important, and this is where some of my research has, has, uh, comes in, um, that um, we can that there is a continual uh, strengthening of anti-corruption networks. I did some research on uh, the, the Solomon Islands ICAC and looked at how it was established. And one of the key things about that, that, um, that legislation is it was established due to a transnational network of anti-corruption reformers, institutions and organisations. And it's really important that responses to corruption in Solomon Islands have this transnational element. Now, not everything about the, the Solomon Islands ICAC um, is, is going to be fantastic. There's some, there's some issues with the legislation. Uh, it faces issues around um, expectations. It's not going to be a magic bullet. Um, but the introduction is a step forward. And I think it, the process of doing so highlights the importance of um, transnational coalitions in responding to corruption. So there's um, more that can be said, but I'll, I'll conclude it here. And what I just want, what I want to say in conclusion is that, look, you know, the, the indicators on corruption um, are limited. You know, we can't know all of what goes on in terms of corruption because it's done in secret. But there are indicators that there have been some improvements in the way in which Solomon Islands has been responding to corruption over the past 15 years. But as Ruth has highlighted, it's still a serious problem. And I think that um, we there is a, a, a still a need to understand and respond to the networks of corruption. Often these are um, political networks. And, and in the past, um, you know, I'm particularly thinking of some of the critiques of Ramsey, these have not been um, as um, front and centre as perhaps they, they might have been. Um, strengthening transnational coalitions and responses is also important. But there's also a question around looking at other non-traditional ways of responding to corruption. Can the one-top system, for example, help to reduce corruption? Um, and um, we could also have a look at the role of education, targeted messages, and gender-focused responses. Um, I've got some literature that I can share, uh, some underlying um, research that, um, that has informed this presentation, uh, which I'm willing to share, happy to share with anybody who might be interested. Just let me know in the, in the chat or questions or what have you. Um, but now I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over um, uh, and uh, uh, to you all to ask questions. Thanks for your time. Go ahead, Lide. I guess Lide is having problem with the network, so I'll take over. Uh, Mr. Grant, there's a question for you. 
So what happens between budget allocation and actual disbursement to those anti-corruption institutions? Why the gap and what could be done about it? This comes from Lina. Thanks for your question, uh, Lena. Look, this is a, a, a really good uh, question. There are often gaps um, when it comes to the disbursement of, um, of funding um, for various agencies. And there can be a, a range of reasons as to why they, um, why they come about. Um, some of it could be to do with capacity, um, and, uh, you know, and, and, or government um, moving funding around. So I, I suppose that what we're trying to track is, is more as to, um, as to how much the agencies are actually receiving um, themselves after, after the budget allocation. And that's not normally tracked. It's not normally discussed. Um, so that's what that's a point of our research. There is another step that needs to be taken, I think, and that is to to get a um, a much better sense as to whether or not these are targeted and deliberate underspendings, um, or whether or not this has got to do with other um, other issues. And on that, um, you know, we're not um, you know you know my myself and and, and Husni are, um, are, are still working through some of um, uh, some of that, uh, but I will say that so we, so we're not entirely sure, and we need to, we need more research to, with with policymakers in Solomon Islands to kind of really to to get to the bottom of this. Um, but what we will note is that Solomon Islands, in terms of its allocations and spending on anti-corruption, is doing much better than, than than from our research than Papua New Guinea is at the moment. So compared to Papua New Guinea, it's as a percentage of the of the budget, it's spending about twice as much. Um, and uh, and so that's I suppose one kind of you know cause for optimism, um, relative optimism. Thank you, Dr. Walton, for that uh, explanation. Uh, we have another question from Pamela Kelly Lorea. Uh, this is actually directed to Ruth. What are your thoughts of the Solomon's ICAC as it has now been four years since its establishment? A follow-up question to that is, uh, has anyone been prosecuted under uh, Solomon's ICAC? Okay, um, thank you very much for the question. And that is a very important and relevant question to ask. I am a commissioner in the Solomon Islands Independent Commission Against Corruption. Since its establishment, this commission has been without any resources, both financial as well as um, uh, human resources. And I think I can also add to uh, what um, uh, Grand, Dr. Grant has just shared, that the, you need research to look into why the actual budget and the budget are not the same. I think part and parcel of the problem is that the development partners are very interested in this uh, fighting corruption. But the money goes through intergovernmental organization, international a government organization like UNDP, uh, that's millions in there. So uh, that contributes to the fact that government does not really worry about what we do because in their mind and in their thinking, we've got enough being given by development partners to do our work. So um, uh, that is to do, that is why currently we only have the commissioners and we only have um, the director general and a financial officer and we're still trying to recruit four years on after uh, establishment what was the second question sorry Ruth. the second question the follow-up question was has anybody been prosecuted Nobody has been prosecuted here in Transparency Solomon Islands. Uh, we provide free legal uh, advice and services where we put together um, victims and witnesses of corruption 
their statement, their evidences and everything, and it has gone to that office. It does not have the manpower, nor the resources, nor the know-how to do its work at the moment. So nobody has been prosecuted by that commission to date. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ruth, for that explanation. Uh, I've got one question actually for both for Grant and for Ruth. Probably uh, Dr. Grant can go first and then Ruth, we can follow. Uh, countries in Melanesians are deeply rooted to their culture. There are also perception that culture promotes corruption. What are your what are your news on this or your thoughts on this? Yeah, look, that's a really important and um, question. So a lot of my research, particularly in Papua New Guinea, but um, to to a lesser degree in Solomon Islands has been focusing on the role that cultural obligations play in people's understanding of corruption and their response to it. So in Papua New Guinea, we know that people in more remote areas and people who are disenfranchised are more likely to be concerned about um, local corruption. They're less concerned about what happens in government. They're less concerned about what happens with millions or hundreds of millions of Kina compared to local issues. and. Um, that uh, that helps to frame their understanding of corruption. However, um, there are, it's also the case that um, my, some of the research that I've been looking at and some of the research with, in Solomon Islands with um, those working to respond to corruption, people have highlighted the role that culture can potentially play, the, the one-top system, for example, can potentially play in responding to corruption. So in... Um, in communities in Papua New Guinea, people talk about the uh, role that community communities play in responding to local concerns about corruption. They beat somebody up if they think that they're doing the wrong thing by the community. Um, in the Solomon Islands, the, uh, the those that I spoke to are also, as the quote that I highlighted um, shows, were also um, you know of the belief that that. Um, the one-talk system could play a role to respond to corruption. However, we know that um, cultural obligations also play a role in perpetuating corruption. Um, it means that public servants um, might favour their one-talks, their, their communities, over other people, um, that they might distribute resources to them, and that there is a really um, big concern about this in the community. So I think that yes, it, it does. It seems to like the, the research seems to suggest that it, it plays a significant role in driving corruption, but there's emerging evidence to suggest that there are ways in which it can be tapped into to also fight corruption. I think we need to more research on this, and we need to um, be looking at ways um, that actually the one talk system can play a positive role in responding to corruption and not just see it as negative. Uh, thank you, Mr. Walton. Uh, Ruth, would you like to say something on that as well? Yeah. Okay. okay. I think whenever we don't find an answer, we always blame culture and custom. I am 72 years old, and I disagree completely with that. People understand what corruption is in our cultural stem, and it is not something that they talk about. I think what we really need to focus on is the big time corruption. And that is, it's not the people of Solomon Islands that are corrupting the government and sipping, uh, siphoning off the millions that should go into development. It's this Asian uh, business people, loggers, miners. I think we really need to focus on what really does hurt, what corruption hurts Solomon Island than those very, very small things and then the members of parliament using the uh, taxpayers money to buy votes and and all of that we have visited more than 40 constituency and more, many more communities in the work that we do here in transparency people want to fight corruption they are ready and willing but they don't have the information and then access to justice is actually non-existence here in the Solomons because it's unaffordable. The last election, this is people's activism, 29 petitions were lodged. It could not go on because the courts require 42,000 before they can accept 
any petition lodged before it. So I think it's more complex than just the culture or all of that. I think we really need to look at the big picture other than putting this, this really uh, issues that have come out quite clearly in the global uh, corruption barometer to address the real issues of culture other than this small time corruption that people are dealing with in any case in their communities. And if there's any community uh, corruption inside the culture, nobody would be alive today in the, in the cultural setting because they are looking after themselves. There is no government, no nothing, only the church and the traditional system that is taking care of it. Whereas as right at the top, there is the big time corruption done by foreigners and their big business partners and their uh, the executive government that we have. So I think we, we really need to focus on what really hurts Solomon Islands, what corruption, who does the corruption that really hurts Solomon Islands and address that instead of, you know, dealing with, you know, blaming the church or blaming the culture as it is the case all the time with things that we don't have answers to. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ruth, for that. Um, I think uh, the questions that we're asking, we actually, uh, we want both of you to answer. There's another question that I've got here is that they are messaging done on corruption. But do you think it is effective? Or, and also, how can messaging be improved? Uh, I think Mr. Walton, if you would like to go first, please. Yeah, so thanks for that. So, all right, so in, in different contexts, in Indonesia, for example, um, and also in I think Nigeria, they've found that uh, in Indonesia in particular, when you test, when you actually test the impact that anti-corruption messages have on people's willingness to respond to corruption, if you uh, give them in any information about corruption through messaging, it can make people more less willing to respond to corruption, less willing to report it, and more favourable towards it, right? So there is some evidence, global evidence, to suggest that anti-corruption messaging can actually backfire. The idea that if you talk about corruption, that people think, oh, other people are engaging in corruption, then it's, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of okay. Um, this is still, there's still some emerging research on this. I can't talk to Solomon Islands um, specifically from the research that I've been doing. I'll just, just note what we've done in, in Papua New Guinea. In Papua New Guinea, the, the um, people are more willing to respond to corruption. They are more concerned about it if you and this this is based on on research that we've done um, if you um, highlight the impact that corruption has on their local communities they are far more likely to be concerned about it to want to um, respond to it in a variety of different ways so messaging can play a really important role in in um, improving people's willingness to respond to it but it doesn't always do that in fact sometimes it does the opposite um, so the emerging research suggests that, yeah, I mean, um, that we need to be careful about what kinds of messaging we are putting out there in terms of, of corruption, because it has the potential, um, the, the research suggests, to make matters worse. But I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over to Ruth to talk a bit more about the, the Solomon Islands uh, ex uh, experience and, and TI. Um, thank you very much. Messaging is very, very important. And uh, I think uh, from the work, not I think, but the, from the work and the experiences of Transparency Solomon Islands and the work that we do throughout the country, um, it is very important not to deliver an abstract message to the people in the community. They've got to be, where do they feature? How does corruption um, affect them, their children? And where does the government uh, how does the government make its money and what is it supposed to do with that money? That messaging needs to have a meaning for the people that you are talking to. It's, but the messaging that is going out from those who have the funds is that which you take out of the internet. And this is what is wrong with that. And at the same time too, 
it needs to be delivered with people or Solomon Islanders like myself and the organization that we are to, to say the things that need to be said and uh, to say it as it should be said, other than worrying about, I mean, previously we had uh, funding that came through um, UNDP and we are not allowed to say certain things because we are UNDP funding funded. These are the kind of um, issues that we have with uh, with uh, with the funding and all of, of of that. So messaging needs to be um, to to have a meaning. It needs to place people. There is a human being behind that message, and how it is affected, and how much money does the government make from the people? For example, when it logs out their forestry. 25% of the royalty goes to the government. And what is it supposed to be doing? These are the kind of messaging that needs to be delivered to the people. And we know that they want to do something, but all they've got is their ways. Uh, the institutions are too unaffordable for them because it's all centrally located. And at national general elections are the only time that they can actually uh, inflict punishment on um, on those who have not done anything good for the country or involved in corruption. So our messaging is a kind of different here and it needs to build a whole picture and a, the, that picture where the people fit in, what is their political, their legal, their civil, their democratic rights. These are the kind of things that will, will make the difference for people to fight corruption. Uh, but this, uh, I understand, and that, uh, and we do acknowledge that um, uh, development partners or other agencies that are in operation in Solomon Islands that have got the money cannot say those things because they are worried about uh, their, with their relationship with the government. But like Transparency Solomon Islands, we don't have to. We were lucky to find funding that leaves us to do what we. Uh, needed to do except of course murder people. So I think I'd just like to to say that messaging is very important, but it delivers, it needs to be delivered by people that do believe in it themselves and not with just someone who's just sticking up deliverables. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you Ruth for that. Thank you, Ruth, for that. Um, I've got a follow-up question to that. Uh, how can cultural practices be used to tackle corruption? Either of you could go first. Okay, I'll go first. I think what uh, Graham, Grant has said is very important and it needs uh, people, each and every one of us, to have a, a, a working, good working understanding of the cultural practices and where, operate, where they operate and when they come into operation. Culture can actually help us fight corruption because there is trust and there is confidence in, in, in that. As, as you, uh, uh, um, as Grant said, so yes, culture can help, but uh, you need to understand all that we we do here in Solomon Islands is culturally sensitive and cultural, culturally savvy. So in the work that we do here at Transparency Solomon Islands, we do not work um, in isolation. We work with the community governance structures or the co constituency governance structures. We go to the communities at their request. We just go, not, don't go and impose on them. So this is how we have managed to um, get through and deliver our message. And we end up being discussed in parliament for a day or more than an hour because they don't like us to educate the uh, voters out there in their constituencies. Thank you. So this role of culture, I mean, I, I agree with everything that Ruth's done. Who's, I mean, she's really on the ground, the expert when it comes to 
you know, understanding the cultural nuances and what's going on um, and what resonates with people. Um, but I, I, I suppose that um, I want to um, say that there is a potential for culture to, to, to play a role. Um, and I'm going to just highlight what I, what I, what I um, said in my presentation before. So one of the criticisms that's been made of the Ramsey intervention, the, the, the um, uh, Ramsey the, uh, peace and nation building um, project was that in terms of corruption, it put in some really good processes, technical processes uh, that highlighted where money was going and you know they had some really good systems. But when the money flowed through the systems, it wasn't very good at understanding who was receiving the check, who were they related to, who's who, you know, how were they integrated into a political network, um, and so some of the, the the respondents that I've been talking to have been critical of that because um, actually it's been argued that whilst the technical processes were there, understanding of cultural and political connections uh, weren't as for, uh, as put on the um, weren't understood, and that's why corruption continued, um, and might have continued to a lesser degree, but it still continued on. So understanding the cultural connections, understanding who's related to whom, uh, who who are they a supporter of politically, and those types of things. Where are they from? You know how uh, those types of things really important, uh, really important. The political economy, the political networks. That help to facilitate corruption within and beyond the, the the country are really important. Ruth's also right in saying, look, we we you know we can get too obsessed by looking at at, at culture as a response. It's a part of the it's a part of it, but you know it's you know the petty corruption that might be facilitated by you know um, people who who want to get funding out of a, a candidate for their vote, for example, pales in comparison in in terms of what's happening in the logging sector and, and other, you know, grand corruption. But if we are to look at uh, look, look at culture, there are there are some things that are already being done. Um, I, uh, I will also say that, um, you know, I'm, and I'm drawing on my understanding in, in, in Papua New Guinea, um, there, are, there are cultural practices which are very transparent often, you know, bride price, for example, in, in PNG. Everyone knows how much money is, um, is, is available. Everyone knows how many pigs people have got, those types, those types of things. There are transparent processes in um, customary practices that um, are not apparent in the modern world. You don't know how much money I've got in my bank account or how much money I'm receiving from various people. It's very, it's very non-transparent. So I think that we can, I agree with, I mean, I think that we can um, turn, um, you know, the, the cultural issues into more of a positive. I think that um, from what I read, by and large, the, the Wontok system in particular gets a pretty hard time for being a key driver of corruption. And perhaps we should be kind of flipping that um, a little bit to have a look at the ways in which it can help with responding to it. And I think there are a number of ways in which that can be done. I think I just want to share with, with regard to Ramsey that I think um, it was more worried about its own project than it does with the corruption in the country. But under the watch of um, uh, Ramsey, this uh, constituency development fund that is channeled through members of parliament stood up from 100,000 to 6.87 million per constituency. And, they, and that fund itself actually corrupts everything, corrupts people, corrupts the members of parliament, corrupts the um, government systems, and it's it's the breeding ground for corruption. So that uh, funding arrangement got its hold when Ramsey was here. They turned a blind eye to it. So it's um, it's one of the funds that was not audited. And uh, a Solomon Islander Auditor General wants to audit it. It was terminated. And up until um, with Transparency Solomon Islands did the work on that. Nobody knew just how much money, public money, these uh, members of parliament were playing with uh, to make sure that they get back into parliament. 
So from 2000 to 2022 is more than 66 million poured into each constituency. And we have uh, visited this constituency, absolutely nothing to, to show for it, but there are palaces and mansions of members of parliament here in town. So I think whilst I agree totally with Grant on the cultural thing, here in Onyara and in the urban areas, it's the misuse and abuse of those cultural practices that are transparent uh, is, is an issue because they are not in the community where they are being told of, no, you're misusing that. They are outside, they're in no man's land to do just as they want to do. So I just want to add that. Uh, thank you, Ruth uh, and uh, Dr. Walton. I've got a question here from Alani, and she is asking, should there be targeted messaging when it comes to informing people from diverse backgrounds? Uh, Mr. Walton, would you like to go first, please? Sure, look, thank you for that, that question. That's a really good one. And what, so, I'm just going to draw on the research that I've been doing, uh, that I've done with a colleague of mine, Karen Pfeiffer, in, um, in Papua New Guinea. So what we found is that if you said to people that um, the corruption impacts on your wantoks and your community, it didn't matter which background you were from because people were just thinking, oh, I know who they are talking about. They're talking about my community, whether or not... Um, you know, you were from the highlands or the islands or the coast or wherever, people were far more likely to, um, as a whole, respond to it. They were also far more likely to be positive about national responses to corruption, not just particular responses to their um, to their background, right? To the, not just their ethnic group. Now, I'm I haven't done this research in Solomon Islands. It, I think it, it might be might be valuable to do so, but um, from that, it suggests that actually you you don't have to have, or you can have um, um, uh, particular messages for communities, but there are also um, broader messages that you could roll out nationally um, that can help to speak to to, to people um, from different different communities. So it's it, uh, our research has suggested that whilst diverse messaging might help. Um, that there are broader national messages that ac actually could cut across. Um, but again, I'm drawing on research uh, from, from PNG and, and Ruth can talk uh, a bit more about the Solomon Islands case. Uh, thank you, Grant. For Solomon Islands, targeted messaging is very important and it needs to be um, appropriate and have meaning for those with whom you are uh, uh, giving this uh, key and critical information too. So for example, here we have an initiative we call Youth for Democracy Camps. So the messaging that we give to them is different from the same messages that we, um, we also deliver at the community and constituency level on the same topics and all of that, but targeting that level, bringing it to, bringing it, bringing home to them how they fit into the overall picture. Why is it important, and what is their responsibilities as waters and duties as waters of of the country, and uh, and um, as the, the who, who need to all to account their uh, representatives and explaining to them that they said we are. The leaders, we are the chiefs, like we are like chiefs. That's why we have to have all this money. Well, I mean, back in the villages, what we are telling them is that no, they are not your leaders, nor are they your chiefs. Those are your church leaders that are already here. Uh, these guys are your representatives. They are supposed to be your ways. They're your servants, and you must talk to them, and you have the right. Otherwise, they wouldn't come and ask for your vote. So it's 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 kind of connecting the dots. So Target, we do targeting messages here in uh, transparency for the schools and then for the youth, uh, young professionals, and then the chiefs, as well as 
the community at large. And we find that it is, um, it gets true to them. They have a meaning and they can relate to it. Um, and it, I mean, you also need to know about the country, which we do have, we do know here transparency and you have examples of uh, how corruption affects them, for example, in the Southlands, in the Temotu Pele, these kind of things are very important. Putting a pace behind the messaging and not data is works for us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ruth. I think for that uh, wonderful answer that you've given us, and I definitely understand that a lot of us uh, are taking all this knowledge. And uh, I've got another question from Saul Edward. Um, what can I, as an individual, do to prevent corruption in my country? I think, uh, Ruth, you should answer first on this. I think I just want to, that's a tough question to ask, uh, and it's a personal one as well. But for me, in my educational journey, I did all I can, learned all I can, taking as much knowledge as I can uh, of, about my country, about where I fit into the society and everything in order that it will help me to be a responsible and respectful and uh, a good citizen of my country and also a useful uh, member of my family and that of my community. I think if you have some principles behind under which you, 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 uh, you operate, then I think you can do it. It, it. it is a lonely job and a very, very lonely place to be fighting corruption so if you have some principles that you you stand by and that makes you who you are you live by then i think you can uh, do whatever you can in whatever area you want to apply yourself to for me is empowering my my people my citizens with pre and critical knowledge about their rights, but also their responsibilities and their duties as uh, citizens of this country, the component part of the state, democratic state of Solomon Islands, and to also um, understand that politicians and governments are temporary, but citizens are permanent part of any country. Thank you. Yes, uh, Dr. Grant, would you like to elaborate on that? Yeah, look, it's a very, it's a difficult question because, um, you know, everyone, as Ruth said, has got um, different, um, uh, a different um, capacities and also a different, um, different willingness to take on, on risk. So, um, you know, fighting corruption, as, as Ruth said, requires, you know, people to, to, um, be able to have uncomfortable uncomfortable conversations to be in uncomfortable situations and many um report you know being worried about payback um but i think that there are things that people can do i think that you know raising awareness talking to family friends um in both urban areas and and in rural areas um, about issues of of corruption joining organizations like transparency international um, and and others that are working to address uh address corruption um joining um you know organizations that are monitoring elections and helping helping to do that i think um also um uh can help so raising awareness is a general um uh, around the, these issues, I think, is important. And with, with a focus on looking at, at solutions that can work. So um, I think one of, the, one of the things that can often come out of um, discor discussions around corruption is a sense of hopelessness. You know, our country is really corrupt. It's, 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 um, it's, you know, it's one of the worst in the world and those types of things. And we can oftentimes re focus on the negative. But I think that turning that around a bit um, in terms of, you know, what I've 
tried to present in my presentation is that, okay, there are significant challenges in the Solomon Islands, but there are causes for optimism, for hope. Thing, bills have been introduced. Civil society has been, um, has been active and has helped to influence um, the government. Now, they might not be as effective as, as some might like, but there have been movements. There's a transnational um, uh, community who's been working on responding to corruption in Solomon Islands and in other, uh, other settings, connecting with um, those organisations and individuals, I think is also uh, you know, a key part of, um, of, of the response. So look, it's a difficult road, as Ruth says, I'm uh, and but uh, I, I do think that um, in terms of responding to, to things in, in Solomon Islands and the broader Pacific, there's room for optimism. Uh, there are a number of points in which you can engage locally, educating, increasing awareness with amongst your community, your friends, but also connecting to um, you know, transnational groups. Um, like Transparency International and others, um, so that you know, so that you're connected to a global movement who are, that are responding to that, and it's not just up to you as an individual. You've got a group or groups to to draw upon to give you strength to help to uh, to respond to this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh... Wonderful answer. Uh, we are about to hit the end of our webinar, but uh, I've got one last question. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Grant and uh, Ruth can both take uh, turns in answering this. Is whistleblower policy effective to country corruption? Sorry, is whistleblower policy effective to counter corruption? Given the context of Solomon Islands being a small nation, when everyone is connected, do you think the secrecy will be maintained? Ms. Ruth, would you like to go first? The Whistleblowers Act that we have in the Solomon Islands, but it is not enough as yet to protect anyone. Uh, so that's uh, number one. And the other thing is that um, uh, all the information and all the um, um, stories that we write, we expose and etc., is co coming from within the system itself. So um, there is determination by uh, the public services. It still has really good people working in it. It's protecting them. That is um, uh, very important. But uh, at the moment. It's a hard ask for anyone, in, especially in the public service, because we're talking about public sector corruption here, yeah, to come out and be a whistleblower because the power rests with the prime minister and also the public service commission that is highly politicized already to terminate you. And for us here in Solomon Islands, the realities are that um, there may be the person that is employed may be the only bread earner for a tribe or for a community that is many, uh, that is supporting the families and all of that. So um, much of the information that is coming out, they don't trust anyone, actually comes to our office and then we repackage it in a way that we're only looking at the issues and then posing other people to do the investigation. So yes, we do have a whistleblowers um, um, act, whistleblowers protection act, but currently it, it does not work. And uh, as you said, it will take a long time before it works here in the Solomon Islands. The institutes, so institutions of integrity and accountability need to step up and do their work on behalf of the citizens of Solomon Island. That way, that is how it has been done in the past. Uh, now they are ill resourced and ill educated about their work to do anything. They're just sitting on desks. So I think probably not a good answer, but that's all I can actually share. Thank you, Ruth. 
Mr. Walton? Yeah, look, I mean, the key um, issue here is how do you ensure anonymity? In other countries, we do see that there have been um, initiatives like such as the Phones Against Corruption initiative to keep, um, to help public servants report corruption um, and, um, and to keep their details anonymous. Now, um, there's also uh, the, the internet. Uh, so there, you know, so it's possible to get anonymous forums um, to uh, which are encrypted to, to ensure that other the people don't know who is who is actually um, reporting. Now there are problems with this in terms of verification and other things, um, but and and these responses need to have resources. But if you can get a credible um, uh, intermediary. Uh, like phones against uh, phones against corruption, you know, internet website reporting um, sites uh, like such as they, they have in India and other countries, you can um, get reports and and um, have it anonymous. It has to be trusted though. It's really important that you don't have things like data breaches and and, and other things. So yes, um, there is a uh, there is this collective action problem where. Whereby at the moment it's difficult to um, to report um, or, or blow the whistle on, on what's happening, um, but there are some solutions um, that that might be some technical solutions that that might help um, with with that um, that have been tried out in other countries. Uh, thank you, Mr. Walton. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, I've got a hands up here from one of the attendees, uh, Hisha Naiker. Just wanted to know if Isha, would you like to ask a question? Isha? Okay, I guess uh, Isha is uh, shy to talk, but I've got another very interesting question here. Um, it's uh, from somebody who wishes to be anonymous. Um, the question is based on Solomon Islands, considered has improved on corruption in the past 15 years. What are your thoughts on the outlook for the next 15 years? Ruth, would you like to go first in that? Yes, I'd like to go first on that. And I would say that there is a ray of off for us to uh, continue to improve and get yes. the real yeah, our, our current uh, scores because we have um, from the programs that we, we run for the youth, youth are not afraid to stand up and be counted and they're doing their own work at their own pace and all of that. So I think the um, the answer is um, yes, we will be improving and we have to think positive about our country because this is the only country that the God gave us. So we need to protect it and we need to make sure that it benefits everyone. So, yeah, uh, I can see Ray of Hope in the youths that are coming up, young professionals, as well as those coming up with that we are touching base with. There is hope for Solomon Islands to improve its score beyond what it is now. Thank you. Mr. Walton, over to you. Yeah, I, I, I think that there is, there is hope. I think that um, uh, in the Pacific, uh, in the region and across the globe, there is now more concern that's being expressed by citizens and um, political elites and others about corruption than um, has been the case for um, for decades, the the Pacific has um, the Pacific Islands Forum has endorsed the Tiawina Vision, which um, is a response from Pacific Island leaders around uh, the importance of addressing corruption. Uh, Solomon Islands has, of course, introduced the the, the ICAC. Look, there's a whistle uh, a blower protection bill that strengthened the ombudsman. Look, all of these things aren't perfect. They, you know, they, they, there needs to be um, more that's been done. 
along with civil society re responses um, and the young population, as um, as as uh, Ruth has has highlighted, there is some um, reason for um, for optimism going into the future. But this is going to re require uh, ongoing engagement from citizens. It's going to require require ongoing engagement uh, and pressure from civil society. Um, and it's going to require a transnational um, alliance. I, I'm, I'm, you know, happy to uh, to look at the glass half full. I think that uh, um, that progress is slow, but it's been slow in many other countries. It's been slow in Australia. Um, we still haven't got a national anti-corruption commission. Solomon Islands has, Papua New Guinea has, Fiji has, um, but. The people in Australia are more concerned about corruption now, arguably, than they were 10, 15 years ago. Um, and I think that this has become, this is on a on a global scale, the concern, concerns about corruption are ramping up. I think Solomon Islands is caught up in this and will, in, in, and, um, and there are um, some good signs that, uh, that people will continue to be con concerned about it um, and that, uh, that reforms will um, start to, Start to um, uh, start to 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 um, be meaningful um, over the coming decade or so. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Walter and Ms. Ruth, for that uh, wonderful. Uh... Uh, answers. I just wanted to know we are about to reach the end of our webinar. Uh, is there any final remarks that you guys would, Ms. Ruth or Mr. Grant, before we close our webinar for the day? Uh, for me, it's just like, uh, from me, my final remark is uh, we think here yeah, that Transparency Solomon Islands. We are on to a good thing with our youth democracy camps, as well as our community outreach program. We just need assistance to mobilize resources so that we can cover more youth and we can cover more uh, communities. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I suppose I just, just want to thank the organizers for, for putting this on. Thanks participants for all your great questions. I liked that uh, we're leaving on a relatively positive note. I think that if we look into the future, there is cause for optimism and we should um, underline that. Um, and, you know, whilst there are significant challenges, I, you know, I, I think that um, uh, there are enough, um, enough indications that, the, that we can be optimistic about what's, what's coming up. We just need, you know, I think, I think that, uh, more people need to be involved. I also would add that I think we need more research on this topic. I think there's lots of things we don't know about what's going on with corruption in Solomon Islands. Um, but even some of those gaps are starting to be starting to be filled. So look, thanks everyone for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Walter, Ms. Ruth. Uh, I guess we have reached the end of our webinar two. Uh, webinar series in the Melanesian region. Uh, International Idea Asia and the Pacific Regional Office would like to thank both the speakers and the audience for joining live to this event. We understand that uh, it is a very busy time right now for you to take out time for this webinar, a very constructive and informative one that is. Uh, a lot of interesting questions was also asked. Uh, we hope that through the discussions, people have gained knowledge about the issues in the e region. Please look out for the dates for our next webinar, and we will be looking forward for your participation uh, in the upcoming uh, webinar that we will be holding. Uh, my sincere apologies uh, from the moderator who dropped out uh, due to some technical uh, uh, difficulties or technical issues. Uh, but nevertheless, we were able to get all the questions uh, in line. Um, thank you. Thank you very much from the IDEA team, Vinaka Vakalevu. If the panelists and the, so if, if the panelists can remain uh, in the session would be helpful. I would like to take a picture of the panelists uh, with their cameras on, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, attendees. Thank you for, for your time and the beautiful questions that you have given. Thank you. Nakash.